Hi, I'm Arlen Walker, and I am live from Pelham's Wasteland, and today I'm going to give you an overview of the Hero's Journey 2nd Edition, um, which is a pretty cool game that uh, it had a 1st edition that I didn't get too into at all. I think I have the PDF somewhere on my hard drive, but 2nd uh, edition is real cool, and so I'm going to talk about it, and uh, stay tuned for that. So let's start with some of first impressions of the book. First impressions, A, game is gorgeous. Um, it has a really great consistent art style. Um, there's some John Hodgson art on the front, and then I don't know who the artist is for a lot of the interior work, but um, it's all black and white uh, penciled, and it looks really good, or I assume that it's penciled. Um, it might be inked, but it's black and white monochrome, um, but it looks really good. It's got a great, really consistent style that I like a lot. Um, and I think that's a big, a big uh, help in, um, you know, making games look beautiful is definitely something nice when you uh, get there. So let's, so that's sort of first impressions. It's all black and white on the interior. Um, the Hero's Journey role-playing author James M. Spann. Interior art, Nicholas Giacodino and Mike Brodu. So it's their um, work that is the interior art. And then it's published by, um, it's Barrel Rider Games and Gallant Knight Games. And I think Gallant Knight Games is the official publisher. Um, so yeah, Hero's Journey 2nd Edition. Um, Let's get into talking about the mechanics. So mechanically, this game uses six attributes, but they are not the standard six attributes. Um, a lot of the rolling is the dice. Um, there's all sorts of different dice in this game. It's not all D20s and D6s. Like some, uh, I think the original white box that this was based on, it was all D6s and D20s. But um, yeah, to get into it, the attributes are might, finesse, resolve, insight, bearing, and wheel. So might is pretty simple. Might is a lot like physical strength. It's just, you know, how uh, mighty you are, how hard you hit, that sort of stuff. Finesse is a lot like dexterity. It's physical coordination and quick reflexes. Um, resolve is your um, mental and physical fortitude, so a lot like constitution, but also for the uh, mental stuff that, you know, it's partly about how well you uh, handle things like, you know, going under a curse or something like that, in addition to just how well you soak up poison and stuff like that. Insight. Insight is our um, mental stat or our primary mental stat. It's kind of wisdom and constitution, wisdom and intelligence rolled into one with a little more of intelligence than wisdom. Bearing is much like charisma. It's their innate magnetism, as the book says. And then we have wheel, and wheel is sort of fate. Um, and each of these stats does different things. So might, for instance, um, this system uses a percentile bonus based on having high stats if those correspond with the um, specific um, the specific uh, uh, class that you are. So warriors receive a 5% bonus to experience points earned if their might is 15 or higher. Characters' might modifiers added to all attack rolls made with melee weapons and to all damage rolls made with melee and thrown weapons. And then finesse works much like dexterity. Resolve um, works much like constitution. Insight much like intelligence bearing, much like charisma. Wheel is kind of an interesting one because it works a little differently. It gives you a certain number of rolls that you get to have advantage on. So if you have a wheel of 18, for instance, and that's a bonus of plus two, um, 
then you get to have advantage. You can declare that you have advantage on two rolls during a game session, which is pretty cool. Um, then there's the experience bonus thing, like I talked about. Um, the universal attribute bonus is uh, much like the one in Stars Without Number or the related games. It's fairly flat, 7 to 14 for no bonus, 15 to 17 for plus 1, and 18 for plus 2. Um, it'd be, but it's pretty easy to change that. And then uh, the book even says, you know, narrators may feel like this isn't enough of a bonus or penalty. So it, very easy to use a different table for that. Um, then we have professions and professions, um, give you basically what you start with. Um, it's a D 100 or D percentile table, and it is specific to your characters. I believe they call it lineage in this game, your characters, uh, race essentially as in most games, but we'll call it lineage because that's what they do in this game. Um, Gives you some starting gear and some starting stuff based on essentially what you did before you were an adventurer. Chapter 2, Lineage, Creating a Character. So we have Changelings, Dwarves, Elves, Half-Elves, Halflings, Humans, and an alternate lineage variant, the Errant Human, which is a human from our world who has been sucked into a fantasy setting. Um, attributes are mostly 3d6 rolled, except every lineage, or most every lineage except human, has a little bit of variation on that. So, for instance, the change link for Finesse, they roll 2d6 plus 6 for their dice pool, which is a little like rolling 3d6 and counting one of them as a 6. Um, so, obviously, that means that their Finesse score is going to be uh, higher than the 3d6 average. Their bearing score is going to be lower than the 3d6 average because it's 2d6 plus 1. Um, there are also level limits, so changelings can only get to level 10 in Swordsman. Other, pretty much everything else, they can get up to level 7, and as a knight, they can only go to level 4. Um, and every lineage has some stuff like this. So, for instance, dwarves can only get to, to level... Um, 10 in Warrior, and they are not allowed to be Wizards, but they get 2d6 plus 6 Might and 2d6 plus 6 Resolve in exchange for 2d6 plus 1 Finesse and 2d6 plus 1 Bearing. Um, elves, similar thing, they can get up to 10 in Wizard. Half-Elves can get up to level 10 in Bard. Halflings can get up to 10 in Yeoman. And humans can get up to 10 in everything and roll 3d6 for all of their um, stats. And then there's some other things that um, the lineage gives you. Almost all of them, it looks like, have three or four. Sometimes halflings have five special things. So, like, halflings get plus two on all attack rolls made when attacking with a thrown weapon or a sling. Silent and unseen... Um, they can be considered silent and invisible when they have some small measure of concealment. Stout heart, small size, keen senses. Um, basically, like I said, every, every lineage gets a couple of special things. And then we have archetypes, which are the classes. Most of the archetypes have some level of requirement. So, for instance, a bard has to have insight 8 and bearing 8. Um, all of them have XP charts, endurance charts. Your endurance, which is your hit points, does not go up a whole lot over levels. Um, for the first three levels, it goes up really quickly, and then it slows way down, which is kind of a really interesting thing about this game. Um, and then there's also... Uh, There's also some special things about all these classes. All of them have their special class abilities. Burglars um, are cool. Knights. Knights have a higher... Knights and Rangers uh, requires 2,500 XP to get to level 2 versus burglars and bards. It only requires 1,250. Um, swordsman, 2,500. Warrior, 2,000. Wizard, 2,500. 
Yeoman 1250. Um, and that's all of the archetypes. So all of them have some special stuff that they get to do, um, which is pretty cool. There's, there's a lot of flavor to all of these archetypes. Um, you'll notice there is no particular cleric archetype, um, which is kind of interesting in terms of what's represented and what's not. I think that has to do with the idea that uh, in a lot of the kind of the literature that this game is trying to emulate, there aren't really uh, clerics. There aren't, you know, there's no clerics in Lord of the Rings or The Hobbit, that sort of thing. Um, then we get on to equipment. If you remember, you get equipment based on your class and your um, profession, what you did before you started adventuring. Um, there's adventuring, a table full of adventuring gear, all the sort of standard stuff, clothing, belt pouches, bed rolls, oil, rations, rope, that sort of thing. Um, then we have uh, transport gear, which is uh, horses, carts, things like that, weapons and armor. So we have a melee weapons table. Um, weapons have variable damage in this system. Um, so it's not all d6 plus one or d6 minus one or something like that. It's actually different dice. Um, melee weapons table, ranged weapons table. It's all the standard stuff that you would expect. Um, you can throw a number of weapons uh, for a shorter distance than you can shoot weapons. So for instance, like a longbow can shoot shoots in 70 foot range incre increments a hand axe can be thrown in 20 foot range increments um there's also armor armor in this game provides damage reduction it also has a a specific weight associated with it and there's rules for encumbrance that use this weight system um but armor in general, is used for uh, the reduction of um, of damage. Armor does not provide you with like an armor class bonus in this game. It actually just reduces the damage that you take. But shields provide you with a defense bonus. So shields are actually used to prevent getting hit. Armor is used to make the hit less uh, effective, that the hit doesn't do as much damage. Um, then there's some stuff for assistance and hirelings. Assistants are um, specialists versus hirelings are all basically uh, men-at-arms types, or technically there's one of them is the men-at-arms and then there's the archer, the cavalry, and the servant. A simple torchbearer or laborer willing to brave the dangers of the dark place of the world. Servants do not fight in combat unless they have no other choice. So that's all that you need to actually build your character. And I'm going to take a short pause right here, recollect my thoughts, and uh, go into playing the game. All right, so we are on to Chapter 5, Playing the Game. Playing the game is a lot like what you would expect. It's got rules for all the stuff you do in the game. So we'll start out with kind of, there's a sort of brief overview of what the narrator does and what the PCs do, the kind of back and forth of playing the game. There's a whole thing about uh, gaining experience and XP rewards related to all the different things that um, you might do in the game. Uh, a section on time and movement. Movement is based on um, carrying up to the might attribute versus uh, higher than the might attribute. And um, movement is actually not as punishing in here as it is in something like AD&D 2nd Edition that we've been playing, where um, dwarves move at 6 and elves at 12. In this case, tall races or tall lineages you move at 12 normally, dwarves or halflings move at 9, and then it's minus 3 for each increment um, over the might attribute, one and a half times or twice the might attribute. Um, there's also movement rate adjustments for moving cautious or moving running versus normal. Um, 
advantage and disadvantage, combat, initiative and surprise, actions, attacking. If the attack roll meets or exceeds the defender's defense, the attack is successful and hits the defender. Um, if the attack hits, roll damage, all of that sort of stuff. Before the damage is inflicted, the defender's reduction value is subtracted from the total damage. And then there's special rules, optional rules, critical hits, and heroic damage. Heroic damage basically allows you to add your level or a portion of your level to the damage dealt with a weapon um, to represent those classes being better at uh, fighting things. Casting a spell, normal movement, you can opt to run and not take a regular move. Normally, player characters have... So, defense. Normally, player characters have a defense of 10. This can be improved if the character has a high finesse, uses a shield, or is under the effect of items or spells that grant magical protection. Um, the attacker must roll a d20 and apply appropriate modifiers. Uh, if the total of the attack roll with all its modifiers meets or exceeds the target's defense, the attack was successful. But then you have reduction value for armor. So, damage and death. Um, this is actually a really kind of brutal system in the sense that if you go down below zero, if you go down to zero or lower, you're down. If you go into negative endurance or uh, are below zero or anything, you have to make special uh, rolls against grievous wounds. So first you make a saving throw against um, getting a grievous wound, and then you roll 1d6 on the table, which is how your character can actually die in combat. So it's not quite as brutal as some systems where like you die at zero or anything like that, but it is, I mean, low-level characters who don't have very good saving throws are going to take grievous wounds if they go down too low. So they... You know, this is really not a system that is designed for kind of heroes just wading through hordes of enemies and cutting them all down and going down and popping back up and all of that sort of stuff um, is what that tells me. Um, there's also despair rules. Um, do do, do. A player character can suffer from despair under the following circumstances that the narrator is free to bring the effects of despair in other circumstances as is appropriate to their own legendarium. When one of the situations described below has happened, the player characters are required to make a saving throw. If the saving throw fails, a character is overwhelmed by despair and suffers disadvantage on all attack rolls and saving throws until the source of despair has been resolved or is no longer present. Um, binding wounds, individual opponents, negotiation and diplomacy, intimidate foes. Um, saving throws and attribute saves. Um, so there's all these rules for the saving throws and stuff, poisons. And then we have a good example of combat, which is... Um, Uh, that is um, a good example of how combat is supposed to go. Um, then we have renown, torches, lanterns, and light sources, wilderness exploration, and hex crawling, a table for wilderness exploration encounters. Um, A note about natural hazards, exploring rough terrain, and there's descriptions of different terrains if you wanted to do a hex crawl, blessed and blighted lands. Some wild places in the world have been cursed and twisted by some great evil or exist under the grace and protection of the forces of good. Travelers in these realms can feel the presence of these respective forces when passing through these places, and whether blighted or blessed, these places have an impact on the characters traveling through them. Swimming and drowning, making camp, 
provisions, sleep and rest, keeping watch, relaxing around the campfire. Um, uh, there's a great sense. It's sort of like kind of reminds me of an OSRified version of the One Ring in some ways, in the sense that there's a lot of stuff about like you know, and it's, it it comes from similar inspirations, right? This is a game that is inspired particularly by that kind of adventuring fiction, The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings in particular, um, as examples. All right, spells and magic. We have a spell list. There are apprentice spells, journeyman spells, and master spells. Um, bards and wizards can cast spells. Elves and half-elves also have some limited access to spells based on the benefits of their lineage. Casting a spell has some requirements, then the spells are cast. Each spell description notes whether it is apprentice, journeyman, or master strength, as well as providing details to its general nature, specific effects, and duration. And so we have a whole bunch of spell descriptions for all of the different um, things. A lot of these spells, one of the really cool things is that a lot of these spells have multiple uses. So they'll have, um, you know, three different potential effects and you get to choose one of them, which is a really cool way that actually the spell list in some ways is a lot longer than it first seemed in the sense that there's a lot more that you can do with these spells, even though, um, there aren't actually that many spells. There are only like five or six per each category. Um, then we have a um, running the game section, a section for the GM. Um, many of the rules have been left broad and left to the judgment of the narrator. This is intentional to allow for flexibility, making the game easily modified to suit the needs of each group. Don't be afraid to modify, alter, or ignore an existing rule if it makes your game more fun for you. There's no default setting, but there are several general assumptions. The world is one of pseudo-medieval trappings with kings and queens, lords and ladies, peasants, castles, and the like. Creatures of legend and myth are very real, but rare and dangerous. A scant few have ever met a wizard, and even fewer have seen a dragon. Similarly, less fantastic creatures are often spoken of as living in the shadowy woodlands on the edge of the village. Goblins, giants, and the like are quite real and live just beyond the horizon. They're creatures spoken of as something that existed in age now belonging to the graybeards and minstrels. Player characters are, by virtue of being player characters, a cut above ordinary folks. Most peasants and farmers never venture further from home than to the next village once or twice a year. On the other side of that, player characters are still mortal and fragile. Even at high levels, a single hero is unlikely to be able to stand alone against a dozen lesser foes. Wizards might wield magic beyond the imagination, and warriors wield blades with perfect mastery. But even these talents mean little in the face of the awesome power of an Elder Worm or the terrible corruption of a Death Knight. Yet the player characters... If the player characters do not stand up to the evil that slithers from the dark dungeons of the world, surely all of civilization will crumble. A brave few stand between hope and annihilation. So then we have a section on being the narrator, stuff about themes, the exploration of the unknown, the fading realm, heroic characters, danger, wonder, all of that sort of stuff. Stuff on bringing the heroes together, designing the different adventures, developing legendariums, challenging the players, and then we have the bestiary. So I'm going to pause the recording again right here, and then we're going to go through the bestiary together. All right, so now we're looking at the Menagerie, Chapter 8, which is the bestiary. And so we have avians. Uh, all the way up to griffins and harpies and down to things like bats. Common folk, guards, nobles, peasants, robbers. Demons with a lord of flame and shadow, who is uh, pretty clearly a balrog, um, of course, just from the name. Dragons. Basilisk, Cockatrice, Elder Worm, Lindworm, Wyvern, Elemental Entities, Equines, Centaur, Hippogriff, Horse, Fae, Fae, Brownie, Fairy Dragon, Fetch, Fae Cat, Fae Consort, and Fae Queen. Giant kin, 
fire giants and frost giants, sky giants, stone giants, trolls, goblins, goblin king, goblin merchant, insects and parasites, lycanthropes, werebear, were-rat, werewolf, strange creatures and animated weapon, Gargoyles, sea serpents, serpent men, wild beasts, bears and goats and rats and stags, wolves, black dog, frost fang, <laughs> hellhound, wargs, wolves, undead, banshees, death knights, skeletons, specters, vampires, whites and zombies, then Wandering Monsters. The Hero's Journey does not use the traditional random encounter system found in many other fantasy role-playing games. When a narrator is running a session of The Hero's Journey, they're telling a larger story, and random encounters can often feel jarring or out of place in a themed narrative if not handled appropriately. That's not to say that wilderness or dungeon encounters shouldn't occur, or that there isn't a chance that the characters might stumble on a strange creature here or there, but these in character these encounters should be used to add tension and theme to an adventure and not an arbitrarily or seemingly out of place combat, even if they are part of the wilderness encounter. If the narrator wants to determine whether the char characters encounter wandering monsters, they should decide how often such roles are made based on the area and the distance from civilization as described in wilderness exploration and hex crawling in chapter five. For example, if the narrator is running an adventure where the players are traveling through goblin-infested woodlands, then if a wandering monster is encountered, it should be goblins, since it shows that the woods are, in fact, goblin-infested in a real and active way at the table. All right. Chapter 9. Treasure and Magic Items. Monsters have some value, carry some of it on their person, and all that sort of stuff. Um... Each time a player character gains a level, they receive a single myth point. This represents the natural growth in their reputation as a hero and how the magic associated with their growing legend is beginning to infuse the gear they carry. In addition, the character can earn up to one additional myth point each time they gain a level if that character has performed some great deed of heroism that is worthy of being remembered and was done in such a fashion that the tale may be spread far and wide. In most circumstances, a character cannot earn more than two myth points total over the course of gaining a single level. Myth points may be spent between sessions to grant mundane items permanent magical abilities. Um, so yeah, this is basically allows you to add what's called aspects. Um, so there are a list of aspects um, So balanced weapons, so balanced, bane, blessed, cold iron, damned, dwarf forged, elven craft, inflamed, fey craft, grievous, renowned, star forged, valiant, winter kissed, heirlooms. So heirlooms are basically special items that you can get by spending myth points um, that are related to the lineage. So changelings have the Book of Nightmares, Fairy Dust, Mask of Courtly Intrigue, Spinster's Cloak, Traceless Gloves, Truth Seeker Spectacles, and all of them have things like this, these special, um, special things for the lineage that are basically, uh, Um, special magical items often that uh, give these lineages something special, a, a, a special thing to a thing to spend myth points on beyond just making your weapon, your sword, or your shield better, basically, that it also gives you um, some special cool things. And then finally, we are at the appendix, which has inspirations, literature, literary inspirations, and there are a bunch of them, and they're very cool. Um, 
film inspirations, role-playing games that inspired this, including both King Arthur Pendragon and The One Ring, so you can see why I like this. There's also um, Beyond the Wall and Other Adventures, which I think is a quite good game itself, too. Um, so, yeah. That's the whole thing. And then there's a character sheet at the very end um, that you can, you also, when you buy the PDF, you get a separate download for the character sheet to just print that out directly. Um, so, yeah, that is the whole thing. That's the, the Hero's Journey 2nd Edition. Um, there's a lot of really cool stuff about it that I like a lot. Um, there's some stuff that feels a little bit... Uh, the, the punishing nature of the going down to zero hit points and combined with not having a lot seems like it's a little bit outside of the, uh, the specific literary influences. And personally, I think I would run this as a 46 drop the lowest for stats campaign type thing that you would have slightly more heroic stats um, because you're supposed to be heroic characters and it it seems like it makes sense that it's not just seems to me that um, while it can be I don't know I, I kind of go back and forth on the idea of average people doing heroic things that type of adventuring and whether or not that how well that works and whether or not that's kind of what I want to play and all of that sort of stuff and anyway um, but I can see where it's coming from, and it's a really cool game. Like I said, it looks really good. The the art in all in all of it is really consistent, and it's got a really cool style that is um, great all the way throughout. Um, the monsters, I didn't talk about it very much. I just sort of went through kind of what they are, but a lot of them have been brought back to their roots, essentially. That's one of the things that the game advertises, that, like, kobolds are not little dragon people they are uh kobolds like they are in um european mythology in in fairy tales um little kind of like dwarves in a sense little men who uh are tricksters and that sort of thing and anyway so there's a lot of stuff like that um yeah overall it's a really cool game um and if i remember it's pretty cheap to get the pdf 10 or $15 um, from Gallant Night Games on DriveThruRPG. I think the print-on-demand version is coming. So, yeah, pretty cool stuff. Um, not quite as broadly compatible with some other OSR stuff because of the stat changes. Um, but you could probably, I mean, you could definitely still tinker with it and uh, get it to work if you wanted. Um, so, yeah. All of that said, it's a, it's a really cool system, and I think I'm going to have to get it to the table at some point. So yeah, that's the Hero's Journey 2nd Edition.